I want us this evening to read <clears throat> verses 9 through 18. This is the third division of the chapter. We'll not discuss all of it. I'm sure we will not have time to do that. <clears throat> verse 9 and verse 10 should take all of our time this evening. I, John, your brother and sharer in the tribulation and royal rule, notice how I translated that, Basilea again, Basilea, and uh, <clears throat> It means kingdom, basically, but it's also used other ways and other places. Going back to verse 6, you remember how we translated the word there. And it's the same here, really. I checked uh, many works on this, and I didn't have any difficulty coming to this conclusion. <clears throat> Having said that, let's read the verse again. I, John, your brother... He didn't say he was an apostle. Your brother. And sharer, that's a compound word in the Greek, has a prepositional prefix, soon, in the tribulation and royal rule and perseverance in Jesus. Now, those are three great statements, and we'll look at them briefly tonight. Then notice another verb, came to be in the island being called Patmos, a doomed place for those who were sent there, an island filled with convicts, and here God's man was sent there. Why was he there? Here it is. Because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why he was there. Now, the tenth verse, the first part of it, is especially controversial. So watch as I read this. John says, I came into the sphere of inspiration. You see, it doesn't read that way in the King James. We'll explain that later. I want to read it again for emphasis. I came into the sphere of inspiration on the Lord's day. And the adjective that is used in translating Lord's Day is used only twice in the New Testament, here and in 1 Corinthians 11:20. And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. But I assure you that this trumpet gave a certain sound. No uncertain sound came out of this trumpet, saying, What you are seeing, you say, wait a minute, you left out a lot. Well, what I left out is not in the Greek text, but it is in the received text, and that's why it's in the King James translation saying, what you are seeing, write in a scroll or a book. And you send it to the seven assemblies. And you don't have to say which are in Asia because that's not in this text. We've already seen that in the fourth verse. <clears throat> Then he names them to Ephesus, 
That's the desired assembly. And to Smyrna, that's the suffering assembly. And to Pergamum, M-U-M, rather than M-O-S, <clears throat> much marriage. To Thyatira, that's affliction. And to Sardis, we've already said something about that, dead, living but dead. And to Philadelphia, brotherly love. And finally, to Laodicea, the people's rights. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, seven assemblies. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, who has clothed himself, one who has clothed himself to the feet, and has bound himself around the breasts with a golden girdle. And the hairs of his head were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like burnished brass, as having been refined in a furnace." and his voice as a sound of many waters. And having in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth proceeds a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, now this is John, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand, his right hand, on me, saying, Do not fear. I am the first, and I am the living one. <clears throat> and became dead, and behold, I am living forevermore, or forever and ever, or for eternity. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. I'm going to go and read the last two verses, even though that's the last division. Write at once. Therefore, the things which you saw are you saw, and the things which are the things you saw and the things which are, and the things which are destined to take place after these things. Now, there's the outline of Revelation. Just as clear as it can be. You don't have to make it say something or try to make it say something that it doesn't say. It just says it. Let's read it again. <clears throat> you write. It's an imperative. And you do it at once. It's an area. It's point action. Therefore, the things you saw and the things which are and the things which are destined to, fall, to take place after these things. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the messengers of the seven assemblies, and the seven lampstands are the seven assemblies. <clears throat> Looking at the ninth verse, I, John, your brother, and share in, and we'll discuss the three things in a moment. This third division I call John's Patmos vision taking in verses 9 through 18. <clears throat> when you look at what he says here in the first part of the ninth verse, I, John, your brother, and share 
in the tribulation. Let's stop with that. In the tribulation. I want you to go back to 2 Timothy. I want you to see that Paul used almost the same terminology. <clears throat> we have a different verb to express it, but the same terminology, basically. I'd like for us to begin with the sixth verse, and we'll just read through the eighth. But the eighth verse is the verse that I want to call attention to in comparison uh, with that which we are studying tonight in Revelation 1 9. Verse 6 For which cause I am reminding you to rekindle the gift of God which is in you by the laying on of my hands. Paul writing to Timothy For God did not give to us a spirit of fear, but of power. And of love and of a sound mind. And a sound mind makes sound judgments. And there is a life that really manifests the truth of God. Of a sound mind. Now verse 8. Therefore. In other words. In view of what you are in Christ. What does he say? Be not ashamed. Of the testimony of our Lord. Nor of me his prisoner. But suffer hardship with. I told you it was a different verb here. But we have that prepositional prefix again. With. Hardship with me in the gospel according to the power of God. What was Paul saying to Timothy? He was saying, Timothy, you must realize... And Timothy was having some problems. It was necessary for Paul to write to him and to encourage him. And that he did. How do we encourage anyone? By giving them what God's Word says. That's the only thing that will give us strength. You can expect to suffer hardship. Every Christian... Not to the same degree, we'll go through hardships, times of suffering, times of trial, times of persecution, to some degree, to some extent. That's the common lot of every child of God. Now I go back to Revelation. I want you to see that Paul was saying practically the same thing. I, John, your brother. I'm so grateful that he used that term. He didn't even say, I'm an apostle. He could have. He was. I'm your brother. I don't like ecclesiastical titles. Do you? The reverend, the most holy reverend, the bishop, the archbishop. And we could just go on and on with all of those human titles. Like when, what's it, Bishop Tutu? <laughs> Woo, boy, he kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't, that, that doesn't send me. He might like to be called that. And evidently he does. More arrogance. Than anything else. I think there are a lot of people. Who profess to know the Lord. They profess to be Christians. They can't even spell the word humility. <clears throat> Much less know what it means. Well they may be able to spell it. Because they're well educated. But they don't know what it means. Humility. Humility. 
So I, John, your brother, and I'm sharing with you these things. So let's begin our exposition of two verses here. Your brother, one who partakes jointly with others, or a sharer, a co-partner, in what? Number one, tribulation, affliction, distress. Used 46 times in the New Testament. And then he uses the word kingdom in the King James. It's basaliah. And that's the basic meaning. But in a lot of the context, we're not in the kingdom. But it also means, as I've told you, looking at verse 6, first of all, royal power or A royalty. And that's what we have here. We're sharing in his royalty. His royal rule in this instance, not the same, used exactly the same way as verse 6. And then finally, and perseverance. I like the translation perseverance rather than patience. The greatest test of the Christian life is endurance or perseverance. He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved, we're told in the New Testament, going back to the Gospels. That's not difficult to understand in the light of the context. The Christian will endure. The Christian will persevere. And the reason he perseveres is because of God's preservation. And you have both of those terms used in 1 Peter 1, verse 5, I think it is. Kept by the power of God. Ready to be revealed in the last days, so forth. So this is the way John begins this particular division. Well, I'd like for us to look at something else. Turn to the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians. 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Not the same kind of experience that Paul tells us about in the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians. Let's begin with the first verse, the first four verses. Now there's some similarity, but yet there are some differences. And we'll see the differences. Chapter 12 is a continuation, actually, of chapters 10 and 11. It was displeasing to Paul to boast. He didn't like to boast. That's humility. Paul counterattacked his enemies on their own ground, however. Although Paul was answering his enemies, he did not think displaying his credentials would be profitable. So he didn't exploit his credentials. I'm an apostle. Now having said that, let's read beginning with verse 1. To boast is necessary. That's the way I've translated it. And in your interlinear, it's a present, middle, infinitive. To boast is necessary, but not profitable. You see, that's strange language. I think we'll see what he's talking about. I shall come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Vision is something visually presented. Revelations are revelation, not always given through what can be seen. 
Most visions, however, contain a revelation. So he spoke of revelations. Verse 2, I have known a man in Christ. I'm going to call attention to the perfect tense verbs here. There are a lot of them in these first four verses. In fact, I haven't counted them, but I think we have, I can count them. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, uh, seven. I count seven perfect tenses here. Let's look at them closely now. I have known. That's a perfect tense. That means he continues to know. He's in a state of knowing. A man in Christ. Fourteen years before. Whether in the body I have not known. That's another perfect. I have not known. And I don't know now. I'm in a state of not knowing. I still can't tell you. I want you to see how important these perfect tense verbs are. So he says, I have not known, or whether apart from the body, I have not known. Another perfect. Then he says, God has known. I want you to know God's always known. There has never been a time when he did not know. And never will be a time when he doesn't know. So I have not known. Then he says, God has known such a man having been caught up. Having been caught up. To the third heaven. And I have known. There's another. Such a man. Whether in the body. Or apart from the body. I have not known. God has known. Verse 4. That he was caught up. Into the paradise. And heard sacred words, which is not being possible for a man to be able to speak. Now that's his testimony. What difference do you see in this and that what John says in Revelation 1 9? John was given a revelation. He was told to write it down and send it to the assemblies. Paul had a tremendous experience. He didn't know whether he had that experience in the body or out of the body. So he doesn't tell us. He didn't know. And since he didn't didn't know, I don't know either. I just know what he tells us. So he doesn't, he didn't really know whether he was in his body, just caught up, body and all, or out of the body. But he was caught up. What difference does it make? He got the message. He heard things, sacred things, not lawful for him to utter. He didn't come back to tell everybody, and he went around for the rest of his life telling everybody everywhere he went the, his heavenly experience. Can you imagine the charismatics that always claiming that they've had all kinds of experiences? They want everybody to know about it. It wasn't for Paul to tell. It was for his personal benefit, and that was it. John not only heard, but he wrote what he had seen, and what he had seen, it was sent to all the assemblies, the seven, which gives us the meaning of completeness. So that's interesting to compare the, the two. Now going back to Daniel's time, when Daniel had a vision, he was told to seal up, this is in the 12th chapter of Daniel, to seal up what he had seen. In other words, what you have seen, you seal it up. Not time 
to tell it all yet. John was told to write it on a scroll and send it to his people in the assemblies. And folks, we have a record of it in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now let's read all of verse 9 and then get into that very controversial statement in the first part of verse 10. I, John, your brother and sharer in the tribulation and royal rule and perseverance in Jesus came to be in the island being called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John wrote as a co-partner with the assemblies in the affliction, the royal rule, and the perseverance. This was not the great tribulation that he talked about in verse 9. The word tribulation means affliction, means persecution, but not the great tribulation. So this has no reference to the great tribulation which will be discussed in this message that God gave to John to give to the assemblies. But affliction, it was affliction common to all saints. That's what he was suffering. The extent of affliction, I must hasten to say, can vary from person to person. You may not be afflicted in the same way I am. I may not be afflicted in the same way that many of you. But we're all going to be afflicted. So affliction can vary from person to person and also from time to time. We're afflicted more at one time than another time. And there's a reason for it. Many times it's for our own chastening. And for other reasons. John was confined in Patmos. And Patmos means my killing, K-I-L-L-I-N-G. That's where they died. That's where they died. But his spirit was not confined. Even though John was confined to Patmos, his spirit was not confined. What do you think gave John Bunyan the courage that he had for 12 long years in Bedford Jail in England, separated from his wife and children, and as he states, especially his blind daughter? Twelve years. It was because his spirit could not be changed. He was confined to Bedford Jail, but his spirit was not chained. Isn't it wonderful? You may be secluded in your home as a result of Ill illness, but your spirit is not secluded. Your spirit can soar as you reflect on the things of God. And folks, that's the beauty of the Christian life. So when the time comes... And you know your days are short and suffering is great. The Spirit can soar. Solitude for Christ is not the worst condition that one can experience. I said, that's not the worst. I said, solitude for Christ. Now, solitude for one's own sin is a different matter. Visions came to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and others while they were in affliction. Isaiah's vision of God's holiness produced conviction. Let me use four names and show you really what happened as a result of the vision. Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6 
of God's holiness produced what in Isaiah? Conviction. As a result of his vision, he had conviction. What we need today, we don't have to have the kind of vision that those men had. We can have a vision by studying the scriptures and be convicted. A vision through the instrumentality of God's Word. Seeing the things that we haven't seen before. Learning the things that we have not learned up to that point in our lives. So conviction. Now, conviction, notice the result of conviction. Oh, I wish we all really knew and had, have really experienced these things. First is conviction. You have to have conviction. If you're not convicted about something, don't expect a real confession. You know why we don't have many confessions today? There has not been any conviction. Do you know why a lot of Christians will not confess their sins? They don't have any conviction of their sins. You know why they don't have any conviction of their sins and their shortcomings? They ignore the Word of God, and many of them don't even know what the Word of God teaches. Now, let's put this together. That's why we want to be practical as we go along. So Isaiah's vision of God's holiness, first of all, produced conviction. His conviction brought confession. Conviction will always result in confession. So when a person doesn't convict, confess, he has no conviction. Thirdly, Confession was followed by cleansing. So you will never be clean until you confess. Isn't that what John tells us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9? If we confess our sins, He is just and able to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When? When we confess. Cleansing responds with what? Consecration. Now, there are four things I want you to get, folks, and this is the teaching of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. First, there must be conviction. <clears throat> conviction brings about confession. Confession is followed with cleansing, and cleansing responds with consecration. So when there is no consecration or you don't see any evidence of genuine consecration, go back, you'll soon find the reason for it. Where these things are involved step by step, one produces the other. So from conviction, confession, confession, to cleansing and cleansing to consecration. That makes sense, doesn't it? Finally, one more. <clears throat> Consecration was climaxed with a commission to Isaiah to do something. And he did it. Commission. That's number five. So the Lord isn't going to give you a commission to do something until the first four requirements are met. That's very practical. That's not just for the preacher. As for all Christians, tribulation was in the assemblies then as tribulation is in the assemblies today. I'm talking about true assemblies. What John suffered, the assemblies suffered. What the assemblies suffered, John suffered. He said, I'm, I'm sharing with you this affliction of this tribulation. Sympathy among Christians is little known in the last days. And folks, that's what scares me to death today. We're further than we might think. There is so little. Yes, folks, there is so little sympathy. Genuine sympathy. You just don't find it. as often and as many people as you would expect. What's the reason for it? What's the cause? 
I like what someone said, and I'll copy it down. Too many non-conducting materials. <laughs> now, some of you know what I'm talking about. Too many non-conducting materials are preventing communication. <clears throat> I don't know if some of you tried to get us the first part of last week. Our phone was out of order several times, about four times, about first three days of last week. <clears throat> One morning at 3 o'clock, our alarm system went off. Not the loudest part of it, but enough to wake Juanita up before it did me. You see, I have to do a lot of her seeing, and she does a lot of my hearing. So we're, we're just glad that we can do that for one another. So she said, anybody could break in the house. You wouldn't even know anyone had broken in if we didn't have an alarm of some kind. But anyway, she was awakened at um, about 3 o'clock. What is that? What is that? And so she went in there, and our security system was on trouble. And there was a faint, about not even like a, a fire alarm, wasn't that loud, because you know how loud that gets. But, uh, so we didn't know even how to turn it off. We've had it several months, but what to get rid of the trouble. And uh, I'll, I'll not make this a long, drawn-out story, but I happen to think of that when too many non-conducting materials are preventing communication. Now, what set it off? That's the question. So she happened to think Richard has his private phone in his room. And so she ran in and, and called the security system. And they were glad that she called because they had tried to get us, and when they tried to get us, they couldn't get through, and that set it off. That set it off. And so we kept having this problem for about three days, off and on. It'd be off several hours sometime. You couldn't call. And I cannot hear Richard's phone when it rings in the other part of the house. It doesn't have a loud ring anyway. And so we decided we'd better report to the telephone company, and the telephone man came out. Of course, first of all, they wanted us to know now, if it's your fault, maybe one of your, uh, one of your telephones. And he first said, you've got a phone off the hook. Well, we looked at our, our phones. Not one of them was off the hook. So they kept trying this and trying that and trying this and trying that, and We'll just have to send them out now. So the next time it happens, call us and we'll come out immediately. So one came out. He looked and he looked and he looked and he said, I just don't know. If it happens again, call us. He couldn't find it. So Ronnie, you used to work for a telephone company. He did you have had problems you couldn't find, I guess. He said, I, I can't find it. It hadn't happened again. But something interrupted the communication and set off our alarm system. Well, the alarm system serves several purposes. Let us know the phone was out. Especially when the company tried to get us, they, were, they say they do that between 2 and 3 o'clock every morning to see that everything is working with all of their systems. And they saw that ours was not working, so they tried to call and couldn't get us, and that set off our alarm. Well, that, I hope, didn't sidetrack us too much from the illustration, but many non-conducting things, materials. So the fine nerves that carry spiritual feeling have become insensible. Does that make sense? I said those fine nerves of feeling that Christians have, they become insensible. So many things today, crowding out, breaking the communication, if you please. So some of the non-conducting hindrances are, I'll name a few, worldliness. Worldliness. What else? False church members. 
What else? Selfishness. What else? Non-recognition of the headship of Christ. That's a serious one, isn't it? Christ is my head. Non-submission to proper authority. And we could just go on and on. These are some of the things that hinder the communication. We may have to be content with Patmos. But folks, we should be happy there if, I said we should be happy there if, and what is the if? Like John, we have a clear vision of all that is to come to pass soon or shortly. If we never lose sight of what is coming, and those things are destined to come, but most of all, the kingdom is coming, and the king is going to rule. There is only one article for tribulation, royal rule, and endurance, and in the Greek, that tells you something. Just one article, the tribulation, and then the other two are connected. So one article with tribulation, royal rule, if you want to call it kingdom, that's okay. Just have the correct understanding of it. And endurance or perseverance. Now the question is, was the kingdom already in existence? See what I'm talking about? We talked about this this morning. Future blessings, what's the answer? Future blessings are often presented as being present. Revelation 1, 6, Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, like Romans 8, 30, especially Romans 4, 17, calling those things that be not as though they were. Christian understands that. He understands it. So the present tense is often put for the future to show that the thing spoken of shall be as certainly happen as if it were already present. That's why we have this futuristic present. Look, I'm coming. I'm coming. So to Christians, the future is by faith already become a present. So by faith, the future becomes in some measure a present to the mind. Although the present has a necessary bearing to a perfect consummation in the future. So what we experience visually and in our minds and our intellects, in the Holy Spirit that God has given us, will be perfected in the future. The assemblies in their local aspect live under different forms of human government, as we have studied lately. But in their perfected state, in the kingdom, they will live under one form of government. There are assemblies of Christ throughout the world. They're living under various forms of government. Some of them are, are atrocious, and ours is not too good. I don't believe it's divine. It's divinely permitted, but it isn't divine, like some people seem to think. Whatever I think, it's, it's right. Nothing else is Wrong? After all, I thought it. In the present, as citizens of earth and heaven at the same time, assemblies have a twofold responsibility. Number one, to God, and secondly, to man. <clears throat> In the present, assemblies hope, but there is no place for hope in the kingdom.
sufferers are conspicuous. So tribulation, royal rule, and perseverance are brought together by one article in the Greek. We experience all of them. Now let's look at that controversial statement. See if we can come to any conclusion. Verse 10. <clears throat> John says, I came into the sphere of inspiration. Well, let me tell you why I have translated it in this manner. Look, first of all, at the very first word. You have an aorist middle indicative verb followed by the preposition in, and this is the locative of sphere. Then you have the word for spirit. So Paul said, I came, I came into the sphere, and I'm translating the word for spirit in the Greek. How? Inspiration. Is that permissible? I challenge you to do something if you don't think it's permissible. Study the word spirit. The many ways the word spirit is used. I assure you, you'll come across it. So I came into the sphere of the inspiration on what day? On the Lord's Day. How many of you, in reading that, have thought that John is talking about like today is the Lord's Day? That's what many people believe this means. It was on the Lord's Day, like today with you and me, that this took place in the experience of John. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. Look at the adjective that is used. Kuriakos. That's an adjective. You notice in your interlinear it is translated imperial. I don't think that's a good translation, but then you'll notice an asterisk and watch down at the bottom of the page, and you're in linear. See 1 Corinthians 11.20. The reason they say that, because it is used only one other place, and it's in reference to the Lord's Supper, which we will observe tonight. The Lord's Supper. Now, let's spend a little time on this. <clears throat> Hold your place there for a moment and go with me to the fourth chapter. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the fourth chapter of Revelation and verses 1 and 2. I want you to notice when we get to verse 2, you have the same terminology, the same Greek construction that you have in Revelation 1 and verse 10. But let's read verse 1, first of all. After these things, what things? Things related to the assemblies, chapters 2 and 3. I saw and behold, a door has been opened. That's a perfect passive participle. Has been opened, and it remains open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I'm going to add at once. At once. Why? I'm saying at once because it's an Aries imperative. Come up here at once, and I will show you things which must occur after these things. Now, does this refer to the rapture of the church? I don't think so. Why use this as dispensational premillennialists use this verse to say this refers to the rapture? He's not talking about the rapture here. 
He said to John, come up here. So keep it where it belongs. Don't try to add something to it. Yes, I believe in the rapture, but I don't believe in using a verse of Scripture that does not refer to the rapture. Now, there was a time when I said this was the rapture. That's been many years ago. Now, look at the next verse. Immediately, you don't have a connective, you don't have a coordinating conjunction, and or chi. Immediately, I came into the sphere of inspiration. Same construction exactly that you have in chapter 1 and verse 10. And what did he say? And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And the one sitting was in appearance like a jasper and car or carnelian stone. And there was, what? A radiance, like a halo radiance around about the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Now, when you look at verse 2, same construction as 110. Now for the second inspiration. This is the second time. He's going to give him something other than what he gave him in the first chapter concerning things relating to the assemblies. Now he's going to give him something relating to prophecy, beginning with the fourth chapter. Now let's go back to chapter 1 for a moment. So you can take some notes on this if you'd like, if you would like. So 110 from man's day to the Lord's day. In 4-2, from earth to heaven. From earth to heaven. And 110, the voice is heard on the earth. 4-2, the voice is heard in heaven. So watch that as you study these two passages. Into the sphere of inspiration is a confirmation of what is sure and the absolute truth of what is recorded. Why? Because he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God because the Scriptures are God-breathed. Does that make sense? So John was in total, and folks, when I say total, I mean total control of the Spirit of God as he was writing these things. That's God-breathed. So you have inspiration. Now watch this. This is not a normal spiritual condition of the believer. I said, this is not a normal spiritual experience. You've never experienced it. I have never experienced it. And furthermore, you never will, and I never will. So he came to be in the sphere of inspiration under total control of the Spirit of God as God gave to him the message to give to the assemblers and now as God gave to John the second time in chapter 4 to, to give the truth concerning prophetical or coming events. Does that make sense? To me that's the simplest thing that I can say on this particular subject. So let's look now in conclusion. <clears throat> So in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, I said it's an interesting and also we must consider the fact that it is greatly debated. John was in a state of prophetic ecstasy. Another way that I express it. He was separated from the world. There he was on the island called the Killing and he was completely separated 
from all of those convicts that were sent there to die. It was in that kind of a situation that God gave to John this marvelous vision. Isn't that wonderful? So he was separated from the world, confined in Patmos, but unconfined in the sphere of what? Inspiration. Being completely controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Furthermore, it does not refer to John's spirit, his human spirit. Many times when you come across the word, pneuma, it means the human spirit. But not always, most cases, it's the Holy Spirit. Here it's not John's spirit. But it does speak of a state characterized by what? And who? Or whom? By the Holy Spirit. And one in whom the Holy Spirit and the whole inner being were for the time absorbed. So Paul, in his ecstatic state, that we read a few moments ago in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 3, was not allowed to record what he saw and heard. He didn't record it. He was not told to do so. John, on the other hand, was commanded to do both. Not only write it, but proclaim it. The same form of words is found in both passages. 1.10 and 4.2. So the scene in chapter 1 was on earth, and the scene in chapter 4 was in heaven. Was in heaven. Looking at the future from God's perspective, if you please. I've already told you there are two views to the meaning of on the Lord's Day. Some say it's the first day of the week. Others say it's the day of the Lord. That is the time of God's judgment, and that's what we find beginning with chapter 4 through the book of Revelation. The Greek word for lords, as I've already told you, is <clears throat> kuriakos, relating to the Lord Jesus Christ. Used here and in 1 Corinthians 11.20. Those who teach it refers to the Lord's day say there is no example in the New Testament of the first day of the week being called the Lord's day. However, it is used to speak of a judicial period associated with the parousia, the Lord's coming. John heard behind him, watch this, John heard behind him a great voice as of a trumpet. In Exodus 3 and verse 14, Moses turned to see who it was that was speaking to him. And what did he see? The tree that burned that was not consumed. Quite a lesson, wasn't it? Quite a lesson for Moses. This was quite a lesson for John. Moses recorded what he saw. John recorded what he saw. So the trumpet-like voice gave no uncertain sound. Write what you see, not the record of some interesting topic. What's what I'm saying now? What did I say? Not the record of some interesting topic. Not for the desire of popular authorship. Not for the hope of financial remuneration. But to say it because it's God's message for God's people. Celestial visions are not the fancies of fiction are the vagaries of human philosophies. Then he says, send it to the churches, send it to the assemblies. 
Christ sustains a common relationship to all assemblies, all assemblies of authority, oversight, and discipline. Three things, authority, oversight, and discipline. He speaks through his messengers. I believe he still speaks through his messengers, his true messengers, as they handle the word correctly. John was not delivered from exile to deliver the letters. Watch this. But he did send them to the assemblies. Send it to the assemblies because it is the revelation of Christ, number one, watch this, dignity, verse 5 of this first chapter. Secondly, deity, verses 8 and 11. And judgment, verses 14 through 16. It is the unveiling, first of all, of Christ's person, chapter 1. His purpose in grace, chapters 2 and 3. And His government, chapters 4 through 22. There you have the outline. Let me say that again. I'm putting it all together. We're trying to give a panoramic view. So I'd like to go over this again with you. Send it to the assemblies. Because it is a revelation, first of all, of Christ's dignity. 1.5. His deity. 1.8 and 11. And His judgment. 1.14 through 16. It is the unveiling of His person, chapter 1, of His purpose in grace, chapters 2 and 3, and His government in chapters 4 through 22. Now, looking at Asia and the seven names of the seven assemblies. Asia means slime pit. South Belt Assembly of Christ is in the slime pit, folks. In the slime pit. Every true assembly is in the slime pit, but not of it. But not of it. In it, but not of it. In the world, but not of it. Ephesus means desired. Smyrna means suffering, as I've already related tonight. Pergamon, much marriage. Thyatira, odor of affliction. Sardis, remnant are the escaping ones. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Laodicea, the people's rights are judgment. This in conclusion. Christ's voice was great. Great. Now let me show you how important this adjective is. I went through all the references in the book of Revelation. And to show you how great the word great is, it's megas in the Greek. The adjective megas is used 82 times in Revelation alone. 113 times in all the other 26 books of the New Testament. Isn't that something? In other words, this adjective is used almost as many times in Revelation in one book as all 26 of the other books use this adjective. Now, with that in mind, what does it mean? Well, it means large in size. It's used in that sense. It's used in the sense of extent. It's used in the sense of intensity, authority, rank, dignity of persons and things. Total intensity. Total intensity. Loud voice, as we have here in Revelation. Now, strong wind, high fever, surprising, best or greatest. This adjective is used more than 30 descriptive ways just in Revelation. Out of the 82 times I found... In my study, that doesn't mean I'm 
100% correct, but I went through all the references to try to arrive at the various ways in which this adjective is used. And here's what I came up with. This adjective, <clears throat> which means great, great voice. Now, I'm not going to repeat great every time, so the word that I give, great would go in front of it. Voice, tribulation, sword, earthquake, wind, day, mountain, star, furnace, river, city, fear, power, authority, hail, wonder, dragon, wrath, thunder, winepress, signs, works, heat, Babylon, plague, horror, amazement, millstone, God, chain. Now you know we're getting close to the end of Revelation. That great chain. White throne. And the wall around the city of Jerusalem. Great wall. Pretty important adjective, I would say. And John wasn't afraid to just continue to use it. He didn't even try to get a synonym for it. <laughs> Many times when I'm writing, I get tired of using the same word, so I get the dictionary. I have a, a dictionary on synonyms. And so I get it down and try to find a different word. You just hate to use the same word all the time. It doesn't make any difference. If you tell the truth, just use it. So John, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he didn't mind to use megas, megas, megas. What do you think, verse 10? Let's read just verses 9 and 10, and then we'll observe the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> I, John, your brother and sharer in the tribulation and royal rule and perseverance in Jesus came to be in this island being called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I came into the sphere of inspiration on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice. That's the first use of Megan. And 81 more times it is used in Revelation. As of a trumpet. As of a trumpet. Saying. That's for you write. You write. And you send the message to the seven assemblies in Asia. The slime pit. Come, brethren. We will.